Very excited to have you all here. I'd love to introduce Alex Rodriguez and Jason Kelly. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Do you know we have theme music? <laughs> I think you're there. I'm not playing short stuff, I'm playing third base. <laughs> yeah, you're playing it. I got it, I have got it, I got it. All right, so I know you may be nervous because you don't do things in front of crowds nope. a lot and you're not familiar with it. Are you good? Definitely um, not in Connecticut. Yeah. <laughs> but we've been having a really good time mm -hmm. doing this show. We um, have. But this is the first time we're doing it in, in front of an audience and I can think of no better person uh, than Connecticut's own, at least at the moment, Hannah Storm. So I was going to like read a bunch about her, but we're gonna get so deep into her background. Are you excited about this I'm one? I'm very excited. I mean, I've been a huge fan of Hannah ever since my Mariner days. I've been really impressed with how she's been able for 30 years, when there was not a lot of women when she came in, to be such a star. And whether it's baseball, basketball, or football, in 30 years, I've never heard one bad thing in any circle about Hannah. So I wanna ask her a little bit about that. Well, without further ado, Hannah Storm. Hey, you guys. Oh my gosh. I can't believe that Alex is interviewing me. <laughs> this is so crazy. We love to turn the tables. We have so much to talk to you about. I know, it's been a while. I've been, <laughs> I've been around a while. <laughs> but let's talk about the current, if we can. Sure. We all care a lot about basketball. Yes. We're gonna talk about how you grew up with it, but can we take a moment to talk about basketball right now? Okay, can we talk about your team, the Minnesota <laughs> Timberwolves? Like, yeah. that's super exciting. Thank I you. think it's great for the game too, right? Thank because you. we tend to focus on the glamor teams, um, but you know, Minnesota's always been in it right there, but I'm super excited for you that they're, Thank you, Hannah. Reaching and, a new level. You remember the early days with the Mariners. Yes. Uh, I always find it great when uh, a city or a team hasn't had a lot of wins in their past and the f fan base is just starving for a winner. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you, Minnesota is not only a basketball town, they're giddy. It's, it's an exciting time, so thank you. See, as an owner, you like those sellouts, oh, yeah, don't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's like, yeah, now yeah. when it comes to writing checks for players, we'll talk. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> It's a different yeah. conversation. But what is it that you feel like, I mean, you study this game, you talk mm -hmm. to everybody in yeah. it, you've seen the whole evolution. Does it feel like something special is happening right now or has been, ha I don't know what, I mean, there's I love a parody. Yeah. I love parody. So to our point, talking about the T-Wolves or talking about teams who haven't been in it in the past, I think it's great to have the Celtics, great to have the Warriors, great. And, and they, you know, maybe on the downslide now, like we, we don't know what's going to happen with them at this point. We always have the Lakers, right? The New York teams have struggled um, for relevance, which has been disappointing, yeah. right? I mean, at times, like the Knicks ha have shown sparks lately, but I think basketball is, is great when the big markets are doing well. But I think what's really exciting for me was seeing Denver win the title yeah. last year. Um, Denver was an old ABA team. Mm -hmm. uh, they were one of the four teams that came over in the merger. That is a great basketball town. To your point, there are fan bases that are absolutely rabid hoops fan bases and they have those fans have always been there so yes I do think I love the parody that yeah. we're seeing even though I would say the teams on both coasts you know I'll throw Philly in there they get a lot of the attention yep. a lot of the media attention we didn't really pay attention to Denver on a national level until like into right. the playoffs right right and they end up winning the title so I think it was a good lesson for everybody like you know let's talk about these other teams let's develop these stars um unfortunately we just kind of sometimes fall into the same old patterns with the same people over the last two three decades you've seen a lot of front offices teams culture obviously we talk a lot about the Miami Heat mm -hmm. Maybe mention two or three that do a really good job with their continuity, their leadership. Uh, oh, Pat Riley, unbelievable, right? Championship coach has kept that Miami team relevant for so long. You know, you're right there. I mean, it's unbelievable, not just bringing the big three in, but, but what Miami has been in recent days. You know, very impressive leaders, like getting Jimmy Butler there was like a game changer, right? He could have stayed in Philly. But I think that Pat Riley has been able to sustain and and build a champion in a, in a market where there's a lot of other stuff to do. You know, so he comes to mind. Um, I do think the Warriors have been a very mm -hmm. well-run franchise um, through the years. You know, they've sustained what we could consider 
a modern day dynasty. In a smaller market, San Antonio, obviously. Oh, well, Greg Popovich, yeah. Pop right. yeah, thank you. I mean, I covered San Antonio back, I mean, I was there in like the Dennis Rodman days yeah, of right. San wow. Antonio. Yeah. But um, yeah, just sustained excellence. That's a great example. We're sticking with basketball, but let's go all the way back. I mean, this is, and we're gonna talk about a new podcast you have later on, but I mean, your DNA, is NBA, ABA, yeah. even, so like. All the way back. Yeah, all the way back. I mean, you you were effectively born into this game. Yeah. Tell us about it. No, yeah, well, my dad was a sports executive. He was in the Marine Corps, um, but he always loved sports. He played football in the Marine Corps, and he played football at Notre Dame for a brief time, one year. He played both ways, one year. <laughs> <laughs> when they specialized, he was like, right. he wasn't really good enough on offense or defense <laughs> to make it. So he was in the Marine Corps. He had um, helped to start a Toys for Tots. I'm sure you guys have heard yeah, of that. Of we were in Chicago. He really wanted to get into sports, and the local team at the time, the Chicago Zephyrs, they just, he was reading in the paper that they couldn't sell tickets. They just couldn't sell tickets to get people in the stand. So he literally went in to the office and said, if I, you know, uh, if I can sell, I'm nobody, but if I can sell X number of tickets, I think it was like 600 or something like that. He was like, will y'all hire me? You know, will you like put me on staff? And they were really? like, sure, what, what do we have yeah. to lose? And so that's how he got his start in basketball. And then we were in Baltimore, Cincinnati, Indianapolis, Louisville, Memphis, Atlanta, Houston. Wow. Um, all different uh, basketball teams. Um, he was in baseball He with the Astros. I mean, he did all sorts of crazy stuff, but mostly basketball. And he ended up being commissioner of the old ABA and setting the ABA and the NBA up for a merger in the mid-70s. So wow. I, as long as I can remember, when wow. it wasn't a school night, we were at games. Yeah. And what I really remember is the referees' names because my mom had played basketball and she used to yell at the referees all the time. <laughs> no like, way. Like, yell. We are in the front row. She is yelling, he walked, get shoe, you know. She's like yelling at the refs. So I remember the refs, all their names distinctly. <laughs> what was it like? Because we have this picture. I mean, you certainly have a very modern and, and intimate yeah. picture of the, of the yeah. NBA. Like, what was it like so, then? So, I mean, picture the NBA slam dunks came from the ABA. So slam dunks were not allowed in the NCAA or the NBA, not even in a warm-up line. Wow. So you're thinking about players who came out of like Dr. J, like out of Rucker Park, right? And out of places where they had these great showy moves, which they were not allowed to do anywhere other than the ABA. Wow. Three-pointers, those came from the ABA. Now, a lot of old ABA guys are really upset right now mm -hmm. at <laughs> the way that three-pointers right, are used. Yeah. A lot of people in the game are kind of upset that the three-pointer is a, is a de facto shot, right? It's not like... It's not like a secondary option, you know, teams that sort of run down the court and just launch three-pointers. I know there's a lot of basketball peers that don't like that, but the three-pointer came from their cheerleaders. Um, crazy halftimes, fun halftimes. They didn't have a TV contract, so they had to make it super entertaining, right. right? So think about all those elements that the players were allowed to come out of high school or college. That was not an option in the NBA. So when you think about like personal empowerment, like player empowerment, like those things, for the first time, players had salary leverage, mm. right? So they were like, well, I have a choice now. I can go to the ABA right. or the NBA. So, hey, I can I can negotiate a little, right? And there were like flat out wars for people like Lou Alcindor, who yeah. later became Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. I do have to say one little story. Uh, back when I was with the Mariners, I played with the Mariners from uh, 94 uh, I was up and down mm -hmm. to uh, 2000 was my last year there. So I remember uh, back in those days, Hannah showed up to one of the stadiums and we're stretching as a team. And, you know, when you're a smaller market team, you never have the big national media. <laughs> and Hannah showed up early one day and we were all stretching. I was like, Hell is Hannah, had a storm. Hannah. So, <laughs> and, and Griffey saying, and Edgar Martinez. And she was a star amongst players. I mean, that, and, and by the way, back in those days when we came up, it's not like now where we have Hulu and Disney Plus. Yes, right. It was just one channel. And right. it was like, the, I, I could just imagine the numbers you guys got back oh, then. Oh, yeah. Massive. Right. So every night at 1130 or what, or in the money, what do you call it, the morning, uh, yeah. the rotation? Either it was like CNN every night at 1130, CNN Sports. I did the baseball show mm -hmm. on CNN. NBC. I mean, you watch the That's NBA, it. you watch one game. Now you're going to watch a triple header, one network. Yeah. So right. you think about it, the numbers were insane. So when she showed up as a player, 
you knew it was a big deal. When Bob <laughs> Costas would show up, yeah. you knew it was a big deal. When I hear Tim McCarver and Joe mm -hmm. Buck, you knew it was playoffs, All-Star, or World Series. That's right. And I always got excited when the big shots came because that was mm -hmm. your time to shine. And that's yeah. what Hannah meant to us even back then in the 90s and 2000s. Yeah, so. and, and, and by the way, Seattle had the Sonics back yeah. in the yeah. day, too. So they had Fun a team. real, we spent a lot of time there um, with that team, which was incredible. The glove, Gary Payton. That's a really Very special cool. place. It really, I'm, I'm glad you had the opportunity to play yeah. there, too. It was awesome. You know? Great fan base, too. Yeah, great fan base. And, and, great, and you had some really cool teammates, too. Along those lines, I mean, as you're experiencing these different cities as a as a as a professional now, yeah. it feels like it's just an extension of how you grew up. You know, there's, yeah. there's certain, <laughs> like, is. I mean, so was yeah. it always natural? I mean, I know that, like, yeah. you end up at Notre Dame. There are a couple yeah. domers in the audience, I know. Good shout out, Irish. <laughs> is sports always in your mind? Well, I think that when you grow up and you move around a lot, I do think that it forces you to very quickly meet people and um, it forces you to quickly find common ground. Yeah. So I am able to pretty much meet anybody and just strike up a conversation, which I think is a blessing. It also forces you to really assess your surroundings and be interested um, in other people. And I think that's one of your great qualities. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes athletes can be like really myopic and, and care about themselves. And I think one of the cool things about Alex is he's always been like curious about other people right. and, and biz, probably, probably why you're in business and probably why you're doing this. Right. You know, in retrospect, everything that happens in your life that is like a huge challenge, right? I do think those things all turn out for good mm -hmm. and can turn out for yeah. good. I'm, I'm maybe not all the time, but I think they can turn out to be a blessing in some strange way later that you might not even realize. Over the last 30 years, you have this male dominated industry. Mm -hmm. How and what can you share with all of us mm -hmm. that allowed you to keep that integrity? Because it's so easy to take the easy cheap shot or yeah. you know go for a headline, but it seemed like you always stayed above it all. Yeah. And again, maintain that reverence and respect from everyone. It's really interesting, your observation, because I do think in the era of social media and now um, it's all about hot takes. Yeah. You know, and look at me and how many followers do I have? What kind of arguments can I get into on X? Mm -hmm. I do think there's a lot of um, self-promotion. I don't think it's all it's not bad. Like I do whatever you want. You know what I mean? But back. I guess in the day, you know, that that didn't exist, but also being the only woman, usually, always, or one of the only women, I mean, you just had to have like a really tough skin and you had to like really, really just put your head down and work and let that speak for itself. Because I would not only have issues like I had with Albert Bell, you know, pretty well publicized. I had, you know, baseball was at, at times, certain teams were very, very difficult mm -hmm. to cover. Um, back in the day, you know, either the athlete was very traditional or a lot of times it was the manager. It wasn't necessarily the athletes. It was like some of the older people in the sport. Um, same thing. I was the first ever NFL sideline reporter for a year. It was horrible, you know, because of just, you know, nobody wanted you there, right? Much less wanted a woman there. So I had a lot of really tough things. Um, but I guess in some ways like that, that really did make me more determined because I was like, oh, oh, okay. Well, you know what? I'm going <laughs> to, yeah. it's go know, time. I mean, yeah. yeah. And, and, and it made me, um, understand that my only recourse was not to, you know, make it about me. Um, but to always take the, always take the higher road and just do my job because, if I just did my job, like that's really just the last word, you know, and also that's what I was getting paid to do. Yeah. You know, you're not you're not getting paid to make yourself the story. Right. And to get into fights with people like at the end of the order, even promote yourself like and I guess I'm old fashioned that way. But at the end of the day, someone is paying me to do a job and it is incumbent upon me to do it to the best of my ability. And that's why. When I had the issue in the dugout with Albert Bell, I had a live shot for CNN. They were going to come to me, and he was, you know, ran through the dugout wielding a bat. All of you get out. All of you, all of you media, get out of here. Everybody fled the dugout except for me because I had a live shot, and my camera was set up, and a little bat boy who was terrified. 
Um, and, and he was, you know, wheeling his bat and, 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 you know, screaming at us. And literally the entire baseball media was out there just watching to see what would happen. And I'm like, I'm not leaving <laughs> this dugout. And, um, it became a, it became a huge deal because it was a world series stage and all the media and everybody was like, wanted to interview me and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, absolutely not. Like, I'm just here to report on what is happening on the field. It took a long, long time. Later, he was fined the largest fine in baseball history, but it took a really long time wow. for that to happen. I guess that's just an example back in the day of yeah. just, you know, being a little stubborn and figuring out how to do my job. I mean, there were players. I remember Bob Nepper was an old pitcher for the Astros. If I was in the Astros locker room, he said, I will not talk to any of the media wow. because you don't belong in here. And I was like, listen, I really don't like it in here either. Like, it's sweaty, gross. I mean, big misconception, like no one wants to go in a locker room. They're disgusting. So I was like, awesome. We, do you mind coming out in the hallway? Absolutely. So I had all these great one-on-one -on -one interviews <laughs> with, with him. That's you know, awesome. same thing with Warren Moon. You know, I didn't want to go in the football locker room. And he was like, you know what, I'll, co I'll come outside and do the interview. So I would just wait, you know what I mean? Just out of respect to my colleagues and and everybody, you know, I just tried to find a solution. But you're alluding to, I mean, so many interesting sort of threads and themes that I know that we want to talk about. And, and one of them that I know we want to discuss is sort of that period in the 90s, especially, I mean, you're living it in baseball, mm -hmm. basketball. Yeah. really comes to the fore sort of in the culture what was it that happened and what did it feel like as jordan you know sort of comes into it and then the nba is just established as this like cultural nexus yeah well i mean what happened was michael jordan yeah it was really interesting because obviously uh bird and magic came out of college that natural you know collegiate rivalry kind of carried over but it was really michael what was so interesting is people forget all the struggles he had early right and how they couldn't get by the detroit pistons right so we're talking about isaiah and dumars and and all of that and this team that was like struggling to get by them and then michael just everything that he did you guys have all watched the last dance but it was just um, his magnetism um, and the things that he did. And it was in the era, and you guys are talking cultural. Do you guys remember must-see TV? Yeah. yeah. Do you remember that phrase? Yeah. Um, so that was like Friends, yep. Seinfeld, and ER, yep. I want to say. Okay. So must-see TV, the NBA kind of became part of must-see TV on NBC. Uh, so it became must-see TV. And what we would do is, so again, you're not, it's not Turner. There's not local, right? It's not like ESPN. Like it's literally NBC. You want to see a game? We're going to give you three games. The basketball was so good because you're talking Barkley. You're talking the mailman, Carmelo. You're talking, I mean, stars. But you're talking three games in a row. There were five games on a weekend. So think about that. You get a triple header on Saturday, a double header on Sunday. Mm. All right. And then it's followed by Jurassic Park, maybe. Okay. Uh, yeah. So wow. I'm saying they would invest in these. In fact, Bob Costas had a, had a, had a really good line one halftime. He was like, do we have a special movie coming up for you? You bet Jurassic. Yeah. Everybody was like, Woo! oh my God. Yeah. But like, but like that kind of epitomized that era of NBC and football had always been sort of a broadcasting tentpole, understanding how basketball um, could do the same. Yeah. And, and by the way, with baseball, we had, I don't know if you remember the short lived baseball network, everybody kind of came together to do like oh, the baseball yeah. network. Mm -hmm, right. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, we had, and I broadcast a ton of world series, like on network television, one network, like really, really strong. And I, I still think the world series has that. It really does. And probably because Alex is you yeah. know, part of the broadcast yeah. team, mm -hmm. but it had that cachet and basketball had to get to that level. Right. It really did. It wasn't at the level of baseball. It wasn't America's game. You know, you used to be able to watch like America's game every week. Everybody watched baseball. The stars were established. It, that's what happened in the 90s is that basketball, because of, I think, Jordan, but also these other stars right. who were like foils, you know, and then he left the game for two years. 
And boom, income like the Rockets, income like Olajuwon and Drexler and Patrick Ewing. Hannah, two questions. Maybe yeah. let the audience know here yeah. what that felt like on game day, right? Because yeah. I, I flew 3,000 miles to go see him. Did you? I, I was thrilled, absolutely. Yeah. Right, because you, you only have maybe a handful of opportunities. My question to you is, how was that like game day? And maybe in a story or two of your exchange with Michael, maybe an interview, how was yeah. he? Really, yeah. Well, Michael, he was amazing. He's really funny. Um, he's really down to earth. Um, now, Ahmad did yeah. all the interviews oh, with right. Michael. Right. Ahmad uh, Rashad. Exclusive. I mean, they were best friends. I did the Western Conference. Ahmad did the Eastern Conference. And then we, and he did every single interview with Michael. But of course, we all, you know, right, we right, knew right, Michael. Right. So I first met him when I was in Charlotte. So Charlotte got a basketball team. I was the only woman in the market. It, that was a really hard market for me. Um, I was always getting mail about the way I, you know, like hate mail at the station, the way I dressed and stuff like that. People didn't, they just didn't, you know, whatever. And nobody was used to having a woman around. So Michael and everybody in the NBA kind of followed him, which was kind of cool. What do you right? mean by that? They followed well, him? Well, his behavior. Oh. Yes. And so we have the Charlotte Hornets. A big thing is Michael being from North Carolina. So they come in to play. It's like this huge deal, blah, 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 blah. And there I am, you know, in the locker room at, again. And I, you know, ask Michael, like, for an interview. And he calls me ma'am. Okay. And I'm like, I'm literally like 23, you know. And I'm like, but it was like that Southern, you know, like, like, like he was like so polite. And he was like so uh, incredible to me. He was wow. so gentlemanly. Everybody else just was like, whoa, like followed in line. Uh, and that was, even though Ahmad was his, his bestie and he did his one-on-ones with Ahmad, he was just exceedingly like that way in general. And NBA locker rooms were by far the best by far the best to cover. I mean, for me as a woman. And a lot of the guys had the opportunity to maybe go to college, at least back then they went to college for a lot longer. So they had been a lot more used to media, big media right. being around. And right. that really helped too. But he does, you know, to Alex's point and to your point, like he does set this new standard and yeah, you know, does. it does usher in this different way that we view not just basketball players, but athletes in general, well, athletes as business people. Well, Nike. Right? I mean, yeah, obviously the 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 shoe deal, which is this the greatest story of all time. Yeah. It was the shoe deal, it was the shoes, it was the marketing, it was some, um, I mean, that that started it all. It's crazy to think that if you say Michael Jordan to my daughters, for example, yeah. who are both teenagers, he's more synonymous with sneakers than yeah. basketball. He is. Well, people call them Jordans, right? They That's don't right. know. And it's funny, I did a uh, whole sneaker series um, for Hulu called Grails that's really, really fun. So Josh Luber, who you, you guys know who he is, so he, he said that he had a pair of Jordans on and he had like, they had like a 23 on the back, right? And he said like some kid was like, what, what's that? Like, why is that number? <laughs> Like on the two, back of your shoe. Yeah, like, like, like to your point, like you have to go to YouTube now, right? Even if you're in, like, who's Michael Jordan, right? And the last dance still a lot, but I mean, he is, it's really, it's the, the Jordan brand, yeah, mm -hmm. right? Is almost and, and has, is very separate from Michael Jordan, the athlete. Yeah. Yeah, it was really a, a golfer now. I mean, he's like into <laughs> golf, he has his, yeah. You know, he has uh, Grove, you know, his own golf course. I mean, he's really into that. I usually see him at the Ryder Cup. That's where we run into each other. Yeah. Just made a lot of money selling his basketball he team. He did well. He yeah, did well. So. Yeah, I hear that that's too. a good investment. Yeah, I mean, it made a lot of money selling the basketball <laughs> team. Apparently, Alex is like, yeah. Alex is like, yeah. <laughs> well, Mark, Mark Cuban sold too. I'm really interested to see what Mark does next because yeah. I think that, you know, he obviously he's obligated to do Shark Tank for a while longer, but he's going to step back from that. So I'm really fascinated to see what like a real, Talk about a real trendsetter. Yeah. Um, another guy who we could have named earlier with the Mavericks are always like right there yeah, right. Um, in contention, and he's always trying to keep them current and in contention. Um, but the, I'm I'm fascinated to see what someone of that caliber. Yeah. And a guy is always kind of forward thinking. I'm really interested to see what he does next. But to that point, I mean, and, and we're sitting here with an NBA owner. I mean, that's the other part of the business that has yeah. changed so dramatically yeah. to the point where we have 
you know, someone like this guy mm -hmm. coming in and being like, this is a good investment and, you know, something that, that I can get behind. What do you make of that? I mean, as a business person, you know, you've started businesses, yeah. you've seen this. What do you make of well, that? Well, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, to me, so I grew up not with an athlete. I grew up around all athletes around my house all the time, just giants. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I mean, they would be around the house. They would come see my dad or come for Thanksgiving or, you know, whatever it was, Christmas party. Um, but, um, so I was always very comfortable around athletes. Um, but I grew up on the business side. Yeah. Right. So I always understood how, um, devastating losing can be on that mm -hmm. level. The criticism that you take, mm -hmm. um, on that level, I guess in a way it's given me a really global perspective on sports, which honestly the average probably commentator doesn't really have. Um, and you know, there's a, a lot of criticism, a lot of yelling, a lot of, I think a lot of people who don't see at times the 360 picture of what it takes. Right. And it's not always as easy as, oh, go out and get this player. You need to do that. Mm -hmm. or You need to do that. You know, I'm speaking from a, from a media standpoint yeah. of how we talk about owners. Right. And how we talk about general managers and something that's a really pet peeve of mine, too, is how we like fire people like how we say they should be fired like that's just not okay because you are talking about someone's livelihood right and you can't throw coaches and coordinators and gms around and owners around like punchlines. now i understand that there are times when owners deserve a lot of criticism something horrible like happened with the clippers obviously sure. okay that that's not what we're talking about here but in general, because your team isn't performing, I mean, there's a lot of factors that go into that, including, by the way, the athlete's, you know, responsibility as well. You're dealing with people's livelihoods. And, and what I understand being on the other side is, is a family. Okay, so I've been, I've had for sale signs put in our front yard mm. by fans. Okay, so wow. I understand that, wow. right? I've had my dad fired. I remember going to Atlanta, being in high school, going to a new high school, and to Turner firing my dad, GM of the Hawks, like months later, by the way, for making a deal that Ted didn't like, but that turned out to be amazing for the Hawks, right? But so I, and I understand those things happen, and I don't hold animosity, but I, I know what it's like to be on the other side. So I guess for me, I always try to be fair. And again, you know, like call somebody, you know, you call people a bum or call them names or whatever. Like, that's just not okay. Yeah. You know, it's just not like if they're, if they're not doing a good job, they might lose their job eventually. It's not up to you to fire the guy. I mean, it doesn't take a genius to see if a team isn't performing. All right. All right. So let's have a conversation about you. It'd give us a great opening to talk about, you know, some, some big transitions that you make in the course of your career. One of the biggest ones is being like, I'm going to go try something that's not sports. Yeah. Tell us about that, yeah. that experience and that decision. I don't know. I mean, listen, I have been doing this I 40 years in the business overall, and I just don't think you can survive that long without being flexible and open-minded. Um, so we, the NBA on NBC ended. Yeah. I had always wanted to do morning television, and the reason that I did is because there were no women on television doing sports when I was growing up. So literally the only women that I had ever seen cover sports were morning television news hosts. I didn't immediately go into sports because I also couldn't get a job being a woman in sports. So my first job was as a heavy metal DJ. Yep. That's and where Hannah Storm comes that's from. That's where my name Storm comes from. Yeah. C101 by the sea. There's the storm coming in late night. <laughs> yeah. I like it. I like it. It just like rolls, it. right? I mean, Little, you still got it. Quiet Riot, Def Leppard, and uh, <laughs> Sammy Hagar, like back to back to back. Anyway, it was good. It was a really relaxing game. But um, yeah, and then I went to Houston and did a radio, and I would spin records on the weekends, and then did um, I did morning and afternoon drive sports, and then I started working for the Astros for their station and the Rocket Station. So that's kind of how I got started. You know, I majored in international studies right. at Notre Dame. So like, I really liked the news. I just thought I didn't want, I wanted to go into sports because sports is fun. Yeah. You know what I mean? But when that ended, I was like, I had little kids and I was like, I'm, I need a job. I need a morning job. I need some job. I just told my agent, I'm not going to be gone in the afternoons. I don't want to be gone all weekend. They're in school. I want to be gone the, the, when they're gone. You know what I mean? If they're going to get up and go to school, that's when I want to be gone and I want to work. 
So we looked at morning, only morning jobs, and CBS was starting a new morning show, one of their many iterations <laughs> of their morning show. Indeed. They got Gail King is obviously killing it and now. How, how was that different for you? It's so different. It's pretty hardcore. Yeah. Um, but you know how, what was really good about it is doing sports, you can ad lib. Right. Mm, like, you know, when, yeah. we, when we go up there and talk, we don't have I mean, some stuff is scripted right, if you're right. leading to like a piece and a director needs a mm -hmm. role cue or something like that. But for the most part, you're thinking yeah. on your feet. Yeah. Right. You're reacting. I found that was like critical as a news person. So I didn't come up like just reading the news. Yeah. You know what I mean? Then it's really hard to react. So I found that I was like a really good interviewer. I also was really used to not tipping my hand about what I thought. I was used to complete and total objectivity. I had also hosted Notre Dame football. And I said, and my boss was like, if I see one glimmer in your eye, little Irish, like happiness or whatever, you're done. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm like, all right, good. So I was like trained. So the good thing about going into news is my personal views. And this is back in the day when we didn't have like polarizing news channels, right. definitely. And I was at the network and they would always give me like all the good political interviews because you could not tell if I was like on one side or the other, you know, everyone would get mad at you, of course, right, right. but it was really cool. And then also like I got to do a ton of cooking. So I became a really good cook, which is my <laughs> other passion. And then we did um, a ton of music, which I already knew. It was kind of like my wheelhouse. And I love that, you know, movie stars. And I mean, it was a really, really cool job. I loved it. Was there like one or two interviews that you were, you can think that you were really nervous either before or during? I would say interviewing President Bush. I would say 43. Yeah. Just like going to the White House. Um, and I was like pretty nervous. Um, what did you wear? But that's a great question. Thank you. Oh my God. <laughs> I can't believe you were. Cause so I wore, um, I was, they have a little softball game on the lawn and I was calling um, their softball game later that day. So it had to be sporty. So I wore like really crisp white slacks and just a white, a white sweater. What kind of shoes? All white flats. <laughs> flats. Yeah, you brew? I love it. I love yes. it. Love it. And you know, he's so funny. He would always build time into his day. So he ran a little early or or, or right on time because he, he's kind of a social guy. Mm -hmm. do, do you know yeah, how oh, you yeah. know him? He, of course you did. Guy. What, he baseball was... guy? So I have my kids with me. And so you do all the, you know, you go in the line and you shake hands and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, um, hey, y'all want to like see the Rose Garden? And I was like, Oh, okay. So just like me, him, and my three kids, like we go and he's like showing them the Rose Guard and then he's like, takes us in the Oval Office and we're hanging out. Like he's like showing them pictures of his family and I'm thinking, don't you have anything to do? Like, <laughs> what, like, what, like what is happening here? And he was like so nice, like talking to them out of nowhere, like magically. He's like, oh, I got a, you know, I got a meeting or whatever. And I was like, wow, like, thank you so much. This was great. And then like out of the blue, a photographer appears, snap, snap, snap. And then like two days later to your house, how did they find you? I don't know. <laughs> but um, is like autographed, like pictures, like for each kid. I mean, wow. it was like the coolest. Ex That's it was awesome. one of those like weird, surreal experiences. But I got to say like before, and I shouldn't have been because he's so down to earth and genuine, but you know, that's a little intimidating going to the yeah. White House, right, for an interview. And it was fine. It was totally, it was yeah. great. And you got a tour of the Rose Garden. So, yeah, it was cool. But then you find your way back to sports. Yeah, so I got fired and everybody did. Our whole show got fired, because that's what that's happens. How, that's what I mean by find your way back yeah. to sports. <laughs> <laughs> you, you got let go. Yeah, exactly. I think that, you know, a lot of times when people are making personnel changes and they went, they made a 360 yeah. where we are taking out everybody. So I got fired. So that's okay. Because all my colleagues did. We all left together, you know, one by one. Right. <laughs> um, and at the time, ESPN was starting a daytime sports center. They had never had sports center during the day. It was all reruns from the night before. And they were going to start a nine to noon sports center. They were going to launch it. And I had the combination of the sports and a daytime television experience. So when you get into that, so you, you get that job, the sports world has, you know, kept going. And obviously you've, you've kept an eye on it. What did you notice that was either different about sports or, or maybe more pointedly about 
sports and media. Well, that you could kind of talk a little bit more about, you know, sort of who you liked or teams. Right. You, you know, it was more personalized. Um, you were, what I noticed a lot about sports media was that people were personalities and that they became studio personalities. So I had always been, you know, I'd always like toe the line. The event is the thing, right? The person you're interviewing is the thing. In news, it's the story is the thing. It's always the story, the story, the story. You know, I came to ESPN in particular, people were developing themselves as, as legitimate stars in just the way they delivered the sports. Okay, which is really interesting, right? So we had always had that on play-by-play. -play. I mean, you mentioned Buck mm -hmm. and Tim McCarver, right? We'd always had that kind of in the play-by-play -play mm -hmm. world. We had these big stars. But they really, it was the studio sure. genre. And so it was more like kind of what we started at, at back when I was at CNN. Like that had kind of exploded, right? And because ESPN was such a national brand, I always call it like America's wallpaper. Like you walk in, it's there. Yeah. Like it's on every TV, it's mm -hmm. on every bar, it's in the, you know, like in the airport. Like, so, so these, these personalities had been able to like infuse a lot of humor and a lot of just sort of their twist on things. And I thought that was a really cool development yeah. in sports. And obviously yeah. that's, you know, huge now. I also want to make sure that we, that we spend a beat talking about your production company, because I know this is a world you've been playing yeah. in. Yeah. Um, obviously, you know, we're all in, in this business to some extent. Yeah. How do you make the decision to do that? And how do you make it, and how do you sort of create something that's that is uniquely you? Right. When I left CBS, so as a news anchor, there are certain things you can't do. I always felt like I wanted a lot of control, you know, over something in my life. Because I'd always worked for big, big companies. So I was like, okay, I have a control in my house and blah, blah, blah sometimes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And I'd written a couple of books because I knew like I could do that. That was like a creative outlet. But I wanted something that I could, control is not a good word. I want something I could create on my own, like kind of how I wanted to do it, right? So I started two things. I started my foundation and I started my production company. Um, I kicked my one of my daughters out of her bedroom at the time. And um, she went into the other bedroom with her sister. So in this little tiny bedroom, I took my, who I'd been working with at CBS, Carmen Belmont, who's here. And we started the two of us, which were still the two of us. Um, we started a production company and a foundation simultaneously before I went to ESPN so mm. that I could grandfather it in to nice. wherever I went. Smart. So we, there's this thing called upfronts where, which you guys know, but just for you guys, it's like where all the advertisers come in and the, all the TV stations and everybody introduces what they're doing to all the advertisers. So they were introducing me at the upfronts and they were also introducing a, a film series called 30 for 30. And I was like, Ooh, that sounds interesting. <laughs> um, so I went up a couple weeks later at work. I introduced myself to the gentleman who was running 30 for 30. And I said, is there anything you don't have or you just can't get? Is there anything you're like, I know you have like two slots left, like anything you can't get. Cause I was thinking, Ooh, what do they need? Maybe I can. And they're like, well, we don't have a women's film and we don't have a tennis film. So I was like, Oh, maybe I'll call my friend Chrissy Everett. <laughs> <laughs> and so I did one of the original 30 for thirties, which was Chrissy and Martina. Yeah. Oh, wow. yeah. That's cool. And then from there, and that was a really cool, great learning experience. Did, um, a, I did branded content. I did, you know, some nine for nine. I did, I did, you know, Shaq and Dale. I did Danica for Epix. And last year did a, my first ever series right. on a couple of young black entrepreneurs, Eastside Golf and who got the first ever Jordan right. contract yeah. ever. Um, for golf. So it's been really, really good, but it's a very hard business. Um, the margins are really small. And so what I did is I just took a part of my paycheck and I just put it into my company. I just self-invested. So because I'm, I'm like an on-air person, you know what I mean? I wasn't like a, a, a TV producer at the time. So I was like, I'm just going to take a part of what I'm earning on TV and I'm going to reinvest it into myself, my company, and my um, foundation. And that's what I did. And we're still, you know, we're yeah. really small, uh, but we, you know, do some cool stuff. I want to build on what you're saying because part of this is about an entirely new media landscape. I mean, you're sort of producing and yeah. selling into it. You right. are experiencing it via Amazon, you know, which, which obviously you did, you did some work with. Give us a sense of where sports media fits in this like wild west disrupted upside down it's fascinating 
I mean, you know, you look at what many people have accomplished with YouTube, I think is, is really great because you can monetize your content there, which I think is super smart. Um, there are a lot, there are other people who are pouring a lot of content into other areas of social media that they don't own, but that they feel like they're going to make it up in terms of, um, uh, being an influencer, um, which is also fascinating to me. Um, there are, I kind of, my new thing is, um, okay, I may not be able to go out and get somebody to spend a half a million or a million dollars on a story that I want to do, but you know what I want to do? I want to own my, my IP. Mm. Okay. So how am I going to do that? All right. Maybe you're going to do that. Maybe you're going to do that in a podcast, right? You can, cause you're going to own, you're going to own your intellectual property. Um, I'm also writing like a graphic novel and I have a, a 12 part, um, podcast with in conjunction my partners are the nba and iheart and it's called nba dna with hannah storm <laughs> so to Check your point out. to your point it's, you could have named it yeah i do think it's important to kind of establish your intellectual property and i think that there's so many tiered ways of doing that so a lot of podcasts m might become a documentary or it might become in your case you know a special something like that um there's there's layers and tiers to everything you can do and i think that's really cool it's cool to think outside of the box and not everything is going to be like a huge money maker, but maybe it's good in another way. Right. Broadcasting, like you're hanging your hat there, right? And then like other things that you're passionate about, really, because it's kind of what it's about, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're passionate about it. You want to do this. You want to sit down and interview people like this is the vehicle that that you came together to do. Like it's fun, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Yeah. Right, and maybe I think somebody. So. I hope so. Yeah. Maybe somebody's not going to sit there and go, "I I need an interview," or "I think I'm going to call up Alex Rodriguez." You know, <laughs> you know, but you're making it happen, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's like super cool. I guess like I always think like super optimistically, you know. And there's there's tons of projects that I've n have never made it to the finish line, right? But you gotta try or just find a different way. Yeah, like find a different avenue. Take my 19 year old who's a freshman at Michigan and. She's uh, studying musical theater. Oh, cool. What advice would you give Natasha and millions of young people out there, not just young women, but young people that want to be the next Hannah? Maybe one or two, three things that you can say yeah. that can be helpful for them. I did a lot of musical theater. Okay. Yeah, okay. including at Notre Dame, which okay. is really cool because then you're kind of a ham, right? You're That's like right. a performer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm sure I wasn't as talented as Natasha, so I was like, I'll go into TV. <laughs> I'm like an okay singer, not a great dancer. But I, I think, you know, this is so cliche, but it's, I always tell people to work really hard. And that's, I know that's like goes without saying, but it doesn't really. Um, I think you have to just grind, man. You got to work so hard, you know, do not um, get discouraged when people say no, because I do think a lot of younger people, because of social media, they put themselves out there, they get negative comments and this and that. They're always like so worried about what other people think. They're afraid of rejection and they're afraid to put themselves out there. And I think you have to, you have to put yourself out there and you have to understand that if, you know, per people don't want to hire you or blah, 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 or they're, you know, the big thing now is like, oh, that company ghosted me. They never got back to me, you know, for a job like that. That can be really hurtful, but I think separating, not taking things personally, and really understanding like a global view of the marketplace, understanding like what you're dealing with, like from big picture, that it's not, it's not always about you, right? So, you know, working on dealing with failure, working on dealing with rejection and staying positive and really, really sticking to, you know, what you want, but just there is zero substitute for working hard. And we're, and I think I just learned that being a woman in a man's industry, I had to almost work harder mm -hmm, than anyone else. And obviously my husband is a, is a sportscaster and he works extremely hard. And I'm not saying I work harder than him, but I'm saying that for me, that work ethic, I'm like, that will always separate me. You know, there's, there's, and you know, playing baseball, what percentage of times does the ball actually meet the bat for a hit? It's, it's right. like, it's like a quarter of the well, times if, you if you're seven, lucky. If you 70%, you right? end up in Cooperstown, you're, right? You're failing 70% and you're a freaking Hall of Famer. Except me. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right. I like that. See, I like that. Too soon. Too soon. I, I know. Too soon. I like, cha -ching. <laughs> but I do think that, you know, think about that, right? Yeah. Think about, and I always think about the baseball analogy, like, and that's okay. You know what I mean? Because you're going to fail like your whole life and that's okay. It's like good. And it's funny you say that because I tell my children this all the time is that 
the fact that I came from a sport that you fail 70% of the time and you're really, really good. I always say like, I have a PhD in failing, but like yeah. I eat nose for breakfast, right? Like it doesn't mean anything to me. I just keep, it's almost like a blind spot. I just keep going. Right. And I have friends that one person says no to them and they're for three months. They're like, Depressed. Paralyzed. Yeah. No, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. And I and I do think that is is unfortunate. And I do think some of that is a result of of just social media and the way that we're ingrained, yeah. you know, into like everything from your physical appearance to this to that. And I, I do think that that's something that we, you know, I think collectively have to really work yeah. work against. And like Billy Jean always says, like if, if you're under pressure, like that's a privilege. Right. Like you have to really Really kind of think of it that way and also be open minded. You know, what you're thinking of is the perfect job and the perfect life. You know, other opportunities are going to come along that you never thought of. And when they do, just like uh, for me, it's always been like, just have an open mind, have an open mind, try things and try things you're afraid of. Thank you so much. This was really fun. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.